Committee will come to order. The committee meets today to hear perspectives on the future nature of warfare. No one can predict the future with certainty. We will inevitably face surprises, but we have to try to peer into the fog looking for trends that point us towards where warfare is headed. History tells us that even great powers can be overwhelmed by change that they do not recognize or to which they do not adapt. Neither our adversaries nor relentless change will wait for us to catch up. Responding to these future indicators does not mean that we can necessarily walk away from more traditional capabilities. The challenge of our times and the challenge of our budgets is that we must be prepared for the full range of threats, from having a strong, credible nuclear deterrent to non-kinetic political influence operations and everything in between. Despite the controversy, there's a lot of truth in former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld's comment that you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want or wish to have at a later time. The military that the United States has depends on the decisions made by Congress as part of our constitutional responsibilities to raise and support, provide and maintain our military forces. Secretary Mattis has testified that the American advantage in every domain of warfare is eroding. That's the reality with which we must prepare for whatever the future brings. We welcome three well-qualified witnesses to help us peer into the future today so that we can better meet our duties under the Constitution to our troops and to our nation. But before turning to them, I would yield to the distinguished acting ranking member, Ms. Davis, for any comments she'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also welcome our witnesses today. Thank you very much for sharing your views with us. Uh, on behalf of the chairman, I want to ask unanimous consent to submit his statement for the record. And if I could just highlight a few things that I know the chairman shares as well, and, um, and the ranking uh, chair particularly highlighting the importance of a whole of government approach. And we know how, Im how really important that is in successfully implementing the national defense strategy, slide of support to expand our partnerships and strengthen our alliances. Of course, fiscal certainty is also critically important, and we're all well aware of the challenges uh, in that regard. And wanting to also speak again, we have to eliminate sequestration and lift the BCA caps. That's going to be important to future uh, efforts of the Defense Department and certainly uh, in defense and in protection of our troops. I hope that we can look at all of our investments and take actions that will yield savings or raise revenues. We certainly have a duty to manage our resources and we appreciate uh, your insights today. Thank you very much. Without objection, the full statement of the ranking member will be made part of the record. We are pleased to welcome today Dr. Tom Mankin, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, Jim Thomas, Principal and Co-Founder of the Telemus Group, and Paul Shari, Senior Fellow and Director, Technology and National Security Program at the Center for New American Security. Thank you all for being with us. Without objection, your full written statements will also be made part of the record, but I would yield to you at this point for any oral comments you'd like to make. Dr. Mankin. Thank you, Chairman Thornberry, uh, Acting Ranking Member Davis, uh, distinguished members of the committee, and thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. Um, this really is a, a vitally important topic. Uh, in recent years, it's become uh, apparent that we're living in a world characterized by peacetime competition between the United States, China, and Russia, and both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy have rightfully emphasized this. Um, of course, competition isn't the same thing as conflict, uh, nor does competition necessarily lead to conflict, but it must be admitted that the chances of great power conflict uh, are increasing, um, maybe remote, but not inconceivable, and growing. Um, what was once a, a hypothetical future contingency is now a real and present danger. And uh, in my prepared statement, uh, which has been entered into the record, I, you know, I, I talk about a number of the challenges. Uh, and, but rather than reading from it, uh, I'd like you to join me in a, in a thought experiment, uh, a thought exercise exploring how a future war could unfold. And it touches on the themes that I lay out in my prepared statement. So let's imagine 
a war between the United States and China over Taiwan. For our purposes today, it's unimportant to describe how the war would break out, merely to believe that such a war is possible, however unlikely. Such a war could very well begin with massive attacks by precision-guided missiles, not only against military facilities in Taiwan, but also against U.S. bases in the region, potentially including those in Japan and on U.S. territory on Guam. How well prepared are the United States and its allies to meet such attacks? This campaign, uh, this, this massive uh, conventional precision uh, missile campaign, could inflict considerable damage on U.S. forces in the Pacific, including U.S. air naval forces. Where would the United States find replacements for these lost forces? Imagine further that Chinese submarines armed with land attack cruise missiles uh, are presumed, suspected, to be lurking in international waters off of American ports, American naval bases such as Norfolk and San Diego. How would the United States balance the need to act in the Western Pacific with the need to defend the U.S. homeland. Now imagine also that China's mobile nuclear land-based ballistic missiles leave their garrisons and are largely unlocated, and that China's nuclear ballistic missile submarines put to sea. How would the possibility, the threat of Chinese nuclear coercion and retaliation, however explicit or implicit, affect our ability to, to act in the Western Pacific? Accompanying the, this uh, massive missile barrage that I described earlier would likely be attacks, perhaps overt, perhaps covert, on networks that support U.S. military operations to include uh, logistics networks, as well as on U.S. communication and, and imagery satellites. Again, as I say, some of that might be overt and apparent. Some of it might be quite murky, difficult to attribute. Precision navigation and timing networks, such as the global positioning system that support the military and a lot more, might be disrupted. How prepared is the United States for a conflict in space and cyberspace? Also accompanying this would likely be a Chinese political warfare campaign aimed at blaming the war on the Taiwanese government, perhaps, uh, and perhaps combined with messaging targeted on members of the US business community with large investments in China, warning of the dire consequences that they would face should the United States intervene in the conflict. Imagine tailored messaging to U.S. allies and friends in the region, uh, viewing the United States or portraying the United States as the interloper, as the, as the outsider. Imagine other messages warning that the, uh, the Chinese government could not guarantee the safety of the thousands and thousands of Americans uh, in China should the United States act. How prepared is the United States to defend against and respond to such political warfare campaigns? Now let's imagine what many of us would see as a, as a positive outcome, a happy outcome, a battlefield victory. Uh, let's imagine that Taiwan, backed by the United States and perhaps others, is able to resist Chinese aggression, that this missile campaign, these other things, uh, don't cause the Taiwanese government to fold. They just steal Taiwan's will. But the result, of course, is not peace, but a protracted conflict with China gearing up for a long war. How prepared is the United States, and how prepared are we and our allies for such a situation? Mr. Chairman, as you, as you noted in your introductory comments, military planners have to place bets against an uncertain future. And it's only when war comes, and we, of course we hope that war doesn't come, but it, it's only when war comes that we can figure out whether those bets have been good ones or not. This scenario and my written, my written testimony point to some current shortfalls as well as the way forward to address them so that we can strengthen deterrence. First, we need to field armed forces that possess depth and resilience to be able to fight, accept damage, and recover. Today, our forces lack readiness and are in dire need of modernization. Moreover, from the bottom to the top, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have grown used to fighting terrorists and insurgents and are unfamiliar with the challenges of great power war. Second, we need a, a defense industrial base and a national security innovation base more broadly that is capable of supporting protracted operations. For two decades, the watchword has been efficiency rather than effectiveness. Moreover, in a globalized, interdependent world, we need to think carefully about foreign investment in strategic industries that bear on defense. 
Third, we need a logistical uh, system capable of operating in contested environments. Getting needed men and material from the United States to forward bases and staging areas to the battlefield will be an increasing challenge. Fourth, we face a growing need to defend the United States, to include our networks and military bases, as well as our space assets. Fifth, we'll need to develop ways to identify and counter foreign efforts to influence our society and, and those of our allies. Russia and China have been practicing political warfare on us for some time, and the magnitude of those efforts is only now becoming apparent. We need to develop countermeasures and responses to those efforts. Here, as in uh, other areas, past experience can, can certainly inform us. And, and as, a, as a historian, I believe in the, uh, the power of history and, uh, and its importance. But the past can also mislead us. There are clearly areas where we need to relearn lost skills, skills that we possessed during the, the Cold War, uh, to uh, include logistics and mobilization. But we shouldn't mindlessly ape past behavior. Great power competition in the 21st century will not be a, a replay of the Cold War. And a future great power war, should one occur, will not be a rerun of World War II or the never fought World War III between the United States and the Soviet Union. Instead, we need to assess thoughtfully the similarities and the differences with the past and rebuild, and in some cases just build, intellectual capital and acquire the capabilities we need to deal with the era that we're in and likely to be in for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, Chairman Thornberry and uh, Ranking Member Davis and members of the committee uh, for, for uh, inviting me to testify today. I'd like to focus my remarks on America's ongoing strategic reorientation towards great power competitions and highlight the significant implications this reorientation will entail. Only a few years ago, senior defense leaders believed it was inconceivable that the United States would ever fight Russia or China. And while war with great powers is not inevitable and can certainly be prevented, uh, it is no longer inconceivable. The new defense strategy has called for treating competitions with China and Russia as the department's top priorities for planning. This represents a potential sea change for readying the US military for future war. To understand why such rebalancing will be necessary requires understanding the profound ramifications this modern multi-sided great power competition uh, in, in its impacts on, on U.S. defense planning. First and foremost, a renewed emphasis on great power competition with Russia and China should lead to a comprehensive reevaluation of the U.S. military's joint expeditionary warfare approach. Both the Russian and Chinese militaries are capable of achieving limited uh, local military and paramilitary objectives before the bulk of U.S. forces could arrive in proximate theaters. And both have built up formidable A2AD complexes that would hinder the US military from gaining footholds nearby or operating with impunity. To be clear, the erosion of the US military's positions in Europe and the Far East is less a consequence of being outmanned than of being increasingly outgunned, outsticked, outpostured in tough away games. The fact that expeditionary warfare lacks the potency and credibility it once had requires the United States to identify and adopt new approaches to projecting power. The prioritization of great power competition in U.S. strategy also means that nuclear forces are once again coming to the forefront of planning efforts. War games and other planning exercises must consider scenarios involving their use in an effort to understand potential escalatory dynamics. The United States must also shore up its theater nuclear warfare capabilities by fielding theater range difficult to intercept nuclear cruise missiles. Such missile could be air or submarine launched and should have a high probability of arrival at a target despite the presence of precision air defenses. Beyond the nuclear dimension, great power competition will also require rebalancing US conventional forces. In particular, it will place a premium on low signature forces with light logistics footprints capable of operating independently far forward in denied areas. Such forces include submarines and unmanned underwater vehicles, long-range penetrating surveillance and strike aircraft, special operations forces, ground-based missile forces, cyber and electronic attack capabilities, and space-based persistent surveillance systems. All of this coupled with vastly greater quantities of precision standoff and direct attack munitions. These forces represent only a fraction of the current US military, but are likely to constitute the core element of a joint vanguard force in any future great power contingency. Rebalancing our forces should be informed by the fact that war with Russia and or China 
would involve target sets that are potentially vastly greater and more geographically distributed than those of regional opponents like North Korea. The United States may have to increase its stocks of preferred precision-guided munitions and delivery systems by more than an order of magnitude to ensure its conventional deterrent is credible. And whatever dangers of collusion and opportunistic aggression there were with respect to regional rogue states, they pale in comparison with the risks associated with Russia and China. Indeed, should war break out between the United States and one of these powers, it is difficult to imagine that one party would not coordinate its war fighting efforts with the other. A strategy that emphasizes great power competition should take account of the likelihood that the other great powers will collude in opposing the United States, both during peacetime competitions as well as in a state of armed conflict. This places a premium on globally fungible forces and capabilities that could be used to inflict unacceptable levels of punishment on multiple adversaries simultaneously. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the competitions the United States faces with Russia and China are likely to last for decades. Winning will likely come from our staying power rather than victory in any decisive battle of annihilation. Thus, it will be critical to maintain national sol solvency over time and to judiciously apply scarce resources, fiscal, human, natural, allied, and technological, in order to fulfill our duty to provide for the common defense, not only for ourselves, but for our posterity. Thank you. Mr. Shari. Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members, thank you for inviting me to testify today. <clears throat> the title of today's hearing is Readying the U.S. Military for Future War. I regret to say that the U.S. military is not ready for the threats we face today. In a recent simulation of a war in the Western Pacific, colleagues of mine at the Center for a New American Security showed that a Chinese missile strike on U.S. bases in the region could destroy more than 200 aircraft on the ground, crater every runway at U.S. air bases in Japan, hit almost every major headquarters within minutes of a conflict beginning, destroy key logistical facilities, and hit almost every U.S. ship in port in Japan. Similar analysis done by other defense experts have consistently shown that the United States' ability to project power abroad has been steadily declining. China's arsenal of hundreds of cruise missiles and over 1,000 ballistic missiles poses a significant threat to U.S. bases in the region and aircraft carriers. The U.S. military faces similar problems in Europe, where the United States has fallen behind Russian investments in long-range precision strike, integrated air defenses, and electronic warfare. These problems did not spring up overnight. Broadly categorized under the label of anti-axis capabilities, these threats to U.S. power projection are well understood. Defense analysts have been warning about the U.S. military's diminishing ability to project power into contested regions for the past two decades. And these threats have been recognized in every official DOD strategy document since the 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review. Moreover, the steps necessary to counter these threats are clear. Increased investment in long-range strike, stealthy uninhabited aircraft to hunt mobile targets, advanced munitions, electronic warfare, and undersea strike. Yet the military has made only halting steps towards these investments. The Air Force is still heavily weighted towards short-range tactical fighter aircraft, and under current plans will remain so for decades to come. The Navy's aircraft carriers similarly only carry short-range fighters, limiting the carrier's usefulness in the early stages of a major conflict. Despite strong pressure from Congress, the Navy has no plans to invest in a long-range strike aircraft to extend the carrier's reach. The Army has even more acute problems in power projection due to a reduction in Army brigades forward-based in Europe and the complete lack of any effective Army modernization for the past 15 years. Why are we here? We spend more money than our adversaries. The United States is a global technology leader, and our warfighters are better educated, trained, and motivated than our adversaries. We have seen this problem coming for two decades, yet we have failed to adequately respond. It is not for lack of money. With sufficient reforms, there's ample money within a $600 billion defense budget. Budgetary stability is needed. The current budgetary instability inflicted on the military due to a failure of the nation's political leaders to reach a bipartisan deal on taxes and entitlements has severely hampered readiness and modernization. We cannot fuel the first class military through government shutdowns, continuing resolutions, and constant uncertainty about long-term spending. But these problems predate the current budgetary crises. Money alone will not cure what ails the Pentagon. Nor is it because DOD has been fixated on wars in the Middle East. 
A lot of taxpayer money went towards military modernization for future threats, even while troops were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. The reason we have failed to adapt is because our system lacks sufficient strategic agility. We have a ponderous and risk-averse acquisition system that develops weapons on decades-long time horizons. This is too slow to keep pace with the rapidly changing world. This problem is compounded by political pressures in the Pentagon, industry, and Congress that make it exceedingly difficult to cancel legacy programs that are less useful for future wars. If our military is to adapt to these threats, Congress must be a willing partner in terminating programs that are no longer needed. And finally, cultural resistance within elements of the military to new paradigms for warfighting, particularly when it comes to using uninhabited and robotic systems. Congressional leadership is needed to help prod the military services towards new ways of fighting that may be uncomfortable, but are necessary if the United States is to remain a global military power. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you all. Okay, we ask all three of y'all to help us peer into the future about the, uh, and the nature of warfare. And all three of y'all come back and say what we have to prepare for is uh, peer competitors, Russia, China. Now, is that because the new defense strategy says that or do y'all really believe that's the direction things are headed and, the, and, and that's the threat for which we have to be prepared? Run down the line right quick. Sure, Mr. Uh, well, I'm, I'm on record uh, over the course of years, I hate to say it, maybe more, more than a decade at this point, saying uh, that great power competition, the perspective of great power war, is the most consequential fa uh, threat that we will face, and therefore it's, it really should be the centerpiece of, uh, of our planning. Not to say that there aren't other contingencies, but the most consequential, the most important uh, contingency that we face out there is the prospect of great power war. I, th I think that's, uh, Tom put it just right, which is it's the most consequential, even if perhaps it's not always going to be the most likely or the most frequent. Uh, and if we prepare adequately uh, for conflict uh, and, and competitions with great powers, that is our best chance at avoiding uh, that, that very outcome. So, Chairman, the, the new NDS um, says that interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, is the primary concern in U.S. national security. I don't agree with that assessment. Um, terrorists killed 3,000 people uh, on 9-11, and terrorists remain a direct threat to the safety and security of American citizens. I think it's important to distinguish between threats to U.S. citizens and their lives and American interests abroad. A lot of other places, Taiwan, the Spratly Islands, Ukraine, those are not U.S. territory. They matter to U.S. interests, right? And I think we do need to prepare for both. I don't agree with the ranking ordering of them. From a financial standpoint, the challenge is that it costs a lot more to compete against countries like Russia or China or to defend against ballistic missile threats from North Korea than fight terrorists. So there are investments we need to make um, to, to do things to prepare for terrorism, uh, things like a new OAX airplane for the Air Force, um, sustaining, for example, the MQ-9 fleet, but they're not as costly uh, as the things you need to do to prepare an interstate strategic competition. Okay, you just confused me. Yep. So you're saying that uh, because we can do some things cheaper, we ought to do those and ignore other things nope. because they're more expensive? We have to do all of them. We have to be we, able to do all of them. I don't agree with, with a rank ordering that demotes terrorism as though that's not a concern. We have okay. to be able to do all of those okay. things. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. That I agree with. But, but then uh, Mr. Shari was very explicit saying we're not ready for great power and competition. Do you all agree with that? I do. Uh, we've taken essentially a quarter century hiatus from thinking about and preparing for these types of contingencies. And I, I would just add to that an, an agreement that uh, we have honed uh, our, uh, our warfighting enterprise uh, around fighting smaller regional contingencies. Uh, our expeditionary warfare approach is tailor-made for going up against Saddam Hussein's Iraq, uh, but it will require a tremendous amount of adaptation uh, to, to, to face Russia or China. Well, and, and I guess that's the last question I want to ask for now. Uh, so on 9-11, we were woefully unprepared for the kind of conflict we were going to engage in for the next 17 years so far. Um, how big a deal is this cultural mindset 
to shift from terrorism and uh, regional sorts of situations that, that you describe, Mr. Thomas, to uh, this return or, or emergence of multiple great power competitions? I'll, I'll start with, with you, Mr. Thomas, and then I'll get everybody. I, I, think it, I think it's challenging, but in a variable way across the force. Uh, and really what you're talking about, and, and I think Paul was getting to this, is it's really about rebalancing in, in, inside of each one of our services, uh, in the Air Force between short range and long range, uh, in the Navy uh, be between surface and subsurface, uh, in the Army between maneuver forces and, and fires, within special operations between uh, direct action and unconventional warfare. So we have big changes to make across all of our services as we adapt. And it's not a question of jettisoning global counterterrorism operations, but it's a question of essentially uh, adjusting the rheostat for, for the joint force. Mr. Shar, do you have any comments on that? Um, yes, sir. We, we do need to rebalance our forces, but it's not actually from terrorism to great fire conflict. It's really this, this middle kind of space that Mr. Thomas described as expeditionary warfare that the military has been focused on. It hasn't really been terrorism. It's been basically refighting the Iraq war. So if we need to go overseas and fight a, a smaller middle power um, where we can have ready access to a nearby land base um, or we can bring our aircraft carriers up close, we are well positioned to do that. Um, if we had to fight from a distance where we don't have access against a greater power, we don't, have, we don't have the ability to do that. Okay, Dr. Mencken. I guess I, I see the cultural challenge as a, as a significant one. Um, you know, we, we spent the first decade after the end of the Cold War in a, a period of sort of unchallenged dominance. And then, as you point out, since then, we've really been focused on, on terrorism and counterinsurgency. We have a whole generation, so 20, 25 years, uh, a professional lifetime in the military, professional lifetime functionally in the, in the civil service. We have, we have a, a whole group that, that really knows nothing other than that, and I'll, I'll count myself as part of that as a, as a Iraq War veteran. Uh, we have people who've had very, uh, very uh, difficult, very personal experiences in a particular type of war that may provide experience, but also may mislead. And it's often said, you know, with respect to, say, China, well, China hasn't fought a war since uh, well, depending on how you count it, 1953 against us in Korea, 1979 against Vietnam. I always ask to the U.S. Armed Services, when was the last time that we fought a peer adversary? For the U.S. Navy, I think that was 1944. I wouldn't even give credit for 1945, the last, last year of World War II. Uh, and so we, we need to reacculturate to a very different type of situation than, than we faced in the last, last 17 years. Okay, thank y'all. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if you could talk about the role, more of the roles and, um, of alliances and partnerships in future wars. I think we would probably all agree that there's certainly uh, an importance to that and the defense strategy speaks to it. But being more nuanced about that, more detailed, what is it that, how would we want to encourage them in certain areas and what are we expecting of them? And then finally, if we don't have that as a priority um, from the highest levels of government, how do we, how do we function with that? <clears throat> you know, for most of the last 25 years, we spent a lot of time uh, encouraging our allies to go uh, out of area with us, to go to the Middle East uh, to provide uh, tanker refueling in the Indian Ocean and doing other things such as that. Um, what we really need right now are allies uh, on the front lines in Europe and in East Asia who are really focused on their own, uh, on defense of their own sovereignty, of their sovereign airspace, uh, their land borders, uh, and their, their maritime approaches uh, to a far greater extent. And, and so this is really, I think this is really hard for the United States because in the past we've asked our allies to be little mini-me's. We wanted them to be a smaller version of the U.S. military. What we're talking about now, I think, is uh, radical differentiation where, in fact, we want our allies to look, in some ways, a lot more like our adversaries. We want our allies to have their own anti-access and area denial capabilities so that they can fend off the power projection gambits of, of potential aggressors. We also want them to provide some sanctuary for us 
so that we can either uh, forward station forces uh, in peacetime as part of a deterrent, or uh, to a more limited extent, flow forces in to reinforce them uh, in a crisis or conflict. Yeah, if I could build off that. So for, first I'd say, you know, our alliances, our allies, really are a, a, com a comparative advantage. And they offer the United States uh, a, lot of, a lot of benefits. Uh, but to agree with what, what Jim just said, I mean, I think we need to have both here at home and also with our, with our close allies, a very frank conversation about what sovereign capability we and our <laughs> allies need to possess and what areas we can truly rely on each other for. So as one example, we have a lot of uh, information sharing agreements with our close allies. We rely on a day-to-day -day basis on information not just produced here but produced there. We rely on that. I think that's a good basis. Are there other areas where we can do that? And to the extent that we can develop truly shared capabilities, it means that, we, you know, that they may not have to reproduce everything that we have and we may not have to reproduce everything that they have. But I think the time is right because of the threat environment, because of the, the fiscal situation, for that type of frank discussion between uh, ourselves and our allies. Dushari? Yeah, so um, I certainly would agree that our alliances are our asymmetric advantage. Uh, and we want to make sure that we take care of them um, and have them ready to, to, for, to use. One of the challenges, I think, is that we've been viewing often alliances um, in this role of, of adding sort of political top cover when we go overseas and do something. We add more people on, build a coalition of the willing. Um, that's important. That's very valuable. For many of these uh, future conflicts against, say, Russia or China, we actually be looking for allies, particularly for basing and access our ability to get into the region. Um, and so not just um, sort of having more flags around the team, but that they really would be vital members for us to be able to go in and, and operate. Is there more than a role uh, only for the military in this as well? How, how would you characterize that? Because we know that in many cases, our ambassadors, our State Department, help negotiate some of those basing agreements. So how, how critical are we actually even looking at that as a priority in that particular need? Yeah, absolutely, it's critical. We certainly, diplomacy is the, the, the method by which you, you build those alliances and sustain them. All right. Here I will invoke history. Uh, you know, during the last period of great power competition during the, uh, during the Cold War, the whole U.S. national security community was involved in the effort. You know, my godmother, who was in the State Department, she was, she was part of our effort to, to counter Soviet communism, Soviet, uh, you know, political, political warfare. Uh, my first job in the Pentagon way back when was, was doing uh, technology transfer uh, controls. Again, that was part of dealing with uh, Soviet technology theft. Uh, and today, similarly, we need a, a multidimensional effort. Now, of course, there are certain things that only the U.S. military can do. Uh, and so that, that needs to be part of it. But certainly we do need a, 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 a whole of government and, and multidimensional effort to deal with the challenges we face today. Thank you very much. I hope the national defense strategy leads us in a, in a direction that we can actually analyze that in a productive manner. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank each of you for being here today, and uh, Dr. Mencken, uh, in particular, uh, being the president of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, we need your input here in Congress on um, uh, budgeting and look forward to that. Uh, as we discuss emerging technology and maintain strategic edge over our adversaries, I'm concerned about the fundamental question that directly impacts our military's readiness for future warfare. The current fiscal environment that we live in is lurching from one CR to another. According to Pew Research, the average time between the start of each fiscal year and the date that the year's final spending bill becomes law has grown from 56 days in fiscal year 1998 to 216 days in fiscal year 2017. Fortunately, with the leadership of Chairman Mac Dornberry and Speaker Paul Ryan, defense funding has passed the House twice last year, uh, and then again today, uh, the House will uh, be voting on defense funding, but the Senate has not uh, achieved votes for passage. I believe that the primary function of Congress is to fund common defense to protect American families to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Could you, uh, again, Dr. Mankin, uh, describe the impact of the inconsistent flat or restrictive funding through the concurrent continuing resolutions has had on the military's ability to prepare for future wars? 
Thank you, Congressman. Uh, yeah, look, I would agree with you that, that the habit of uh, budgeting through continuing resolutions has been a, a tremendously corrosive one. And I know, you know, in, in this committee, I'm, I'm pretty much speaking to the choir, but I'm, I'm concerned, as much as an American citizen and American taxpayer as anything else, uh, that at the end of the day, we, you know, the Congress will pass a continuing resolution, will kind of, members will pat themselves on the back that they've done well, but, uh, you know, it does have a corrosive effect. If we just take a, just let's, let's say a program, let's, uh, it could be a, a bomber program, it could be a submarine program, whatever, uh, a program that's ramping up, that's moving towards production, right, as we need modernization. What does the continuing resolution do? Continuing resolution freezes the funding at that of the previous year, where more funding is needed, where we need to uh, gear up a production line, where we need to hire people, where we need to get things uh, going to move, move something into production, something to, uh, to replace aging equipment. CR really hurts that, and it delays it. And CR after CR after CR just compounds that. And so again, I, I worry that, that, that uh, too many people think that we're doing well, we're, we're passing CRs, but particularly when it comes to modernization, not exclusively modernization, but particularly when it comes to modernization, it is truly corrosive over time. And, and equally, uh, the effect on uh, contracting with, uh, business, with private businesses, can you explain how that uh, is affected? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, you know, they're putting resources, they're making bets towards, uh, towards, future, towards future funding. And, and that amounts to, hire, again, hiring people, hiring talented people uh, to help with design, with production. And where the money is either not forthcoming or it's delayed, it's just more and more difficult to get those talented, skilled people on board uh, to produce the, the, the capabilities that we need to defend the nation. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, as a grateful dad of uh, sons who, uh, four who served in Iraq, Egypt, and Afghanistan. I always uh, was um, so uh, pleased to know we had technology like uh, unmanned aerial vehicles over their head, uh, which I counted on to protect them. And then recently, I've had the opportunity to see advances of unmanned ground vehicles. Uh, it's just the technology is just phenomenal to uh, climb stairs, to go through hallways, uh, to uh, pr go into caves, uh, forested areas. But I'm really concerned. What recommendations do you have to expedite these new technologies so that they're not multi-year delays? <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman, um, and, um, th and I really appreciate your remarks. Uh, you know, the, the unmanned revolution is, is coming, and I think culturally this is often seen as a threat to, our, uh, to, to some of our, our, our service members in the sense that it's, it's a robot versus a human, and I think you really put your finger on it which this is about saving lives, and this is about um, augmenting and empowering humans uh, so that they have greater span of control and that they can do more things uh, and overcome some of the physiological limitations of humans. Um, so all of that is to the better. In terms of uh, accelerating uh, the, the entry into the force, you know, I think we have a couple problems. One is we have a technology transition problem, that there's lots of stuff that's going on in the DARPA world, uh, but the programs uh, then get caught in this, in this uh, valley of death, that the services are not in integrating them into their program objective memoranda as quickly as we would like. And I think part of the problem is that um, collectively, we tend to commit uh, uh, acquisition infanticide. Uh, once you're in the program of record, you're in pretty good shape because there are lots of special interests and there are service proponents and there are lots of people who will keep you in the program of record. But it's very tough for some of these new technologies and some of these, these new systems to just gain entry into the program of record. And this is something where, as Paul was saying earlier, this is a critical role that Congress can play in essentially stimulating the department as it's done historically on a lot of critical capabilities like Tomahawk cruise missiles in the 1970s and 1980s or the, uh, Predator UAVs where Congress really can play uh, a catalytic role in, in driving this. Thank you very much. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, each of you for being here and for the, the big thinking uh, that you put into the question of you know, future warfare and our, our readiness. Uh, thanks for your perspectives here today. Uh, it seems uh, that our services strive uh, to be ready uh, and well equipped to do everything. I think one of you testified that we need to do everything. Um, and I think each of you agreed that it's just a matter of balance 
and setting the priorities. And that's true whether our budget is in the $500 billion range or what we're looking at maybe for, for fiscal year 18 in the $600 billion range. President, I believe, is going to be asking for something in the $700 billion range for the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, it's about balancing and priorities to take on all of these missions and tasks that the services have been asked uh, to address. Um, a few months ago, a member of this committee asked senior military leaders uh, to identify uh, either acquisitions or programs or maybe even missions uh, that they would rather not pursue, uh, but for reasons beyond their control, namely Congress's will, uh, they are forced to pursue or to procure or acquire and spend. Uh, does your, your view, your study of these issues, are you able to identify perhaps today, give some examples of some acquisitions or programs uh, that are way out of balance? And when I say out of balance, more on the side where we're doing too much of it today and we could actually scale back so that we can invest resources in those areas where the balance uh, is, is working to the detriment of, of an important mission or program. I'll, I'll give one example. It's not, it's not a program, but it, it, is, uh, it is in infrastructure. I mean, I, I do think that the U.S. military, Department of Defense, has more infrastructure, more bases, uh, than, it does, than it does forces. And I think that, that infrastructure, that overhead, costs. And so, not, not to bat things back in the, in the Court of Congress, but, but I think another, another round of uh, uh, base realignment and closure is at least something that should be should be on the table. Don't wouldn't prejudge the outcome of it, but that's I think that's something that's um, that that should be that should be part of it. I think unfortunately, all all too often because we've we've deferred modernization repeatedly, particularly for the types of contingencies we're talking about. It, it's <laughs> the programs that should have been cut were already cut. Maybe even some of the programs that shouldn't have been cut have already been cut in in past years. So I'm 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 at I'm at pains to find savings there. Uh, I would be looking I'd be looking elsewhere. I would I would add uh, two two categories to that broadly. I think one is um, given this issue of great power competitions is about range that uh, we have to rebalance across our entire joint force between short range and longer range forces. Uh, and there I'd say we're probably over investing in short range systems, whether those be aircraft or those be uh, ground-based artillery systems and the like, uh, we're going to need uh, <clears throat> uh, just much greater, uh, to operate at much greater distances than we have in the, in the recent past. Uh, and in this way, it, this is kind of reminiscent of the Cold War where we had to think about uh, long range ground-based missile systems uh, and we had uh, a much larger bomber force and the like. The other area, um, as was mentioned earlier, is, is in terms of balancing between manned and unmanned systems. Um, we know that the biggest driver on uh, DOD cost growth has come from personnel, uh, personnel compensation, benefits, et cetera. Um, as we look ahead, unmanned systems not only uh, may be more operationally effective for many of the missions we, we ask them to perform, but they also can help us in terms of lowering the costs of things like training and life cycle uh, sustainment and the like. How do we uh, essentially position ourselves to reap some of the downstream uh, cost benefits from these systems I think will be important. So just to add on to what Jim said, um, I see within both the Navy and the Air Force some fundamental cultural realignments that will have to change over the coming decades. Um, for, for the Air Force, it's principally about range. And it's important that it's not just about hardware, it's about people inside the Air Force. Because what you're talking about doing is changing the organizational structure inside the Air Force of who has power. Moving from what has been a fighter-centric organization over the past several decades towards one that now has a greater emphasis on long-range strike, long-range bombers, and reduced emphasis on fighters, and that's gonna change the sort of balance of power inside the services between these communities. And that's where congressional leadership is very important. I see a similar need in the, in the Navy to emphasize undersea. Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Um, we have vulnerabilities as a nation, whether it comes from legacy or whether it comes from a strong reliance on uh, exquisite uh, satellites in space that are 
very expensive, very capable, but also potentially very vulnerable. But I want to turn this around. You know, we have our vulnerabilities. What vulnerabilities, you know, God forbid there's ever a conflict, but what vulnerabilities do China and Russia have in particular that it might be wise to pay attention to for all three of you? Well, if, if I could maybe begin. Um, <clears throat> I think the greatest uh, source of vulnerability for both China and Russia is uh, their um, lack of political legitimacy long term. That's fundamental. And both of them face enormous internal security risks, uh, how they meet the demands of their people. But you know, if you're Russia, you've got to govern and you've got to maintain security across 11 time zones. Uh, if you think we have problems with a, uh, thinking about concurrency and can we fight two nearly simultaneous wars, what does that look like from Russia's perspective, or China's for that matter? Do they have the command and control to do it? Uh, can't, do they have the logistics to do it? Can they split their forces like that? Um, they also have uh, a number of uh, historical uh, uh, competitions on their borders. Uh, they don't have great neighbors like we do with Mexico and Canada. And so that's something that they always have to be on guard about. Um, so the, I would just leave, leave those as a couple major vulnerabilities that these countries have. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, and, and I would say really the, the political warfare campaigns that we see China and Russia waging against us are, in fact, you know, efforts to, that, to, to weaken us, to weaken our morale, to divide us, because what they actually fear uh, is you know, the, the, uh, the vibrancy of, of, of our democracy. It's a reflection, in a way, of the weakness of, of the authoritarian political model. They see us as uh, trying to overthrow them, whether we're actually doing it or not. Our culture, our society, is, uh, offers such, uh, such an example that others within their, uh, their borders, without any uh, uh, backing by the US government, <clears throat> seek, seek to emulate it. So I think the, the authoritarian political system is a, uh, is a, is a deep, critical vulnerability for those, for those states. Okay, I hear what you're saying, I agree a thousand percent, uh, but you're really getting more into soft power. And I agree that, that that's vital and is our ace up the sleeve, you might say. But, when it but I want to talk about hard power. What are military vulnerabilities that these two near peers have? Sure, so um, if I may, I think, Certainly in electronic warfare and cyberspace, they have similar vulnerabilities that come from any kind of digitally enabled or network system that we have. Those are places where we ought to be able to exploit those. We're a high technology country. We should be able to be dominant in those spaces. It's gonna be contested, but we should be able to use that space to exploit their vulnerabilities and disable their systems or, or degrade them at least. Um, I also think on the command and control side, because of the nature of being authoritarian regimes, even inside their military structure, they're likely to have more vulnerabilities to their command and control being more brittle um, because their people are, they're less likely to trust their people and they're less likely to be able to take the initiative the way that, that US personnel are going to be able to do. And so that's something we ought to think about how to exploit that in a wartime environment. Let me just take a shot at uh, judo throwing the, the problem that we face from an American perspective, which is, uh, we see that power projection is getting tougher for us and our ability, uh, you know, we're, that our position is eroding across all domains of warfare. This affects us the most because we're the country that is, uh, is most branded itself as being in the power projection business. But it's going to affect all countries and it's going to affect Russia and China when it comes to local power projection. And this is something we can exploit. They're going to be very vulnerable as they try to project power beyond their borders. Uh, that they're going to have a lot of the problems we do, but at a, at a smaller scale. And this is something we can exploit by you know, arming our allies with anti-access and area denial capabilities, by denying them effective use of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, by uh, uh, pinning them in uh, geographically into certain areas and not letting them break out. Uh, these are things that we, can, that we could do very effectively. But again, it requires a radically different approach to warfare than the one we've had for the last 25 years. Thank you very much. Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, I come from the central coast of California. 
uh, on the Central Coast, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the military institutions that we have there, educational institutions such as Navy Postgraduate School, as well as uh, DLI, Defense Language Institute. Uh, and so just to kind of give you a foundation of what my questions are going to be focused on, um, uh, you know, obviously you've talked a lot about uh, operational, uh, what we can do in the future for operations, but you also mentioned a couple words like cultural resistance, I think you used, and uh, multidimensional efforts as well. Narrowing it down in regards to our educational investments, uh, would that be a part of these multidimensional efforts? Would it be a part of helping the cultural change? And if so, what type of investments should we have in our military educational systems? So, so as uh, somebody who's spent a good, uh, a good chunk of his career in the professional military education uh, uh, system, uh, I, it won't surprise you uh, to hear. Look, I, I think I think professional military education is crucial to this, and I was I was heartened uh, by the language on that in the in the uh, summary of the national defense strategy that was that was released the other week. Look, I think um, both at, sort of at the strategic level in understanding uh, the character and conduct of war, understanding strategy, uh, understanding foreign cultures. Uh, and becoming true military professionals, education is 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 crucial. Right. I think that you know part of the cultural change that needs to uh, needs to come about can come about through professional military education. When it comes to and you mentioned you mentioned DLI, I, mean, I think the Defense Department does about as good a job as can be done educating <clears throat> adults. In, in foreign languages, I think we need to we need to do that. We also need to look for ways to bring in folks, heritage speakers of, of foreign language, uh, to kind of get them along that uh, along that path. I think we should explore things like uh, get uh, bonuses or either requirements or bonuses for uh, ROTC scholarship recipients, uh, cadets, midshipmen to take on hard foreign languages. The, the earlier you learn a foreign language, the better the better off you are. So I think education clearly is, is key to our strategic effectiveness. Uh, thank you. No, I think that these institutions can be really vital in helping to um, encourage service members to experiment, think outside the box about new ways of war fighting. And I'll give two examples. Um, at NPS in particular, um, there's really incredible uh, experimentation going on on swarming warfare tactics. People that, things that no one has ever really thought about before, now that you have robotic swarms, um, and we've demonstrated them over 100 uh, small drones flying together as part of a swarm. How do you fight with that? How do you command and control that entity? How do you counter someone else's swarm? What's the right tactics for that? NPS is doing both physical and then modeling and simulation computer experiments trying to figure that out. Um, but you know, more broadly, I frequently get um, service members reaching out to me from these institutions when they're there working in, in courses. Uh, it gives them a role to think tank, asking questions about, hey, I'm writing a paper on some new concept for warfare, whether it's robotics or something else. And, you know, hey, are the things I should look into, the things I should be reading about, can you give me some thoughts on this? So it gives service members an opportunity to then take a step back in their careers, think about history, think about broad patterns of innovation, and then start to apply that kind of thinking to the future of warfare and, and their roles going forward, which is great. Yeah, I just I think cross pollination is is really critical, and you know I think back to um, uh, uh, a, a previous uh, revolution in warfare in the 19th century, and there were there were leaders like Bismarck in Prussia who happened to also be in the railroad business, and they were able to uh, take lessons they were learning from the commercial sector and bring them in and transform warfare. That's a role that professional military educational institutions like Naval Postgraduate School can, can, can play today, uh, and, and it really is a national gem. I would say the other thing that's really important is, uh, uh, is um, IMET, but it's, it's our uh, international military educational and training programs, and bringing uh, ally and partner uh, military leaders to the United States where they're going to interact on a daily basis with, uh, with um, uh, rising uh, U.S. military officers and NCOs, uh, but they're building personal uh, connections that will last a lifetime. But it's also the cross-pollination uh, that, you know, the United States doesn't have a monopoly on all the great military ideas, uh, and there's a lot we can learn from some of these students coming through our programs. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. I want to begin, Mr. Thomas, with you and go specifically to uh, Secretary Mattis' national defense strategy where he notes that uh, rapid technological advancements and the changing character of war are going to force the U.S. to change and modernize more quickly than our adversaries, which is sort of the beginning of where, where things are going. He did mention specifically directed energy and hypersonics as some of those areas where we really have to make, make those advancements. And, and in my district in Virginia, the Dalgren Naval Support Facility is doing a lot of work within those particular areas. Let me get your perspective on what we face as far as emerging capabilities with our adversaries, things like unmanned systems. Give me your perspective on what we're seeing now where you're going to have actually the employment of a more modern laser on board the USS Portland LPD-27, an upcoming deployment. Give me your perspective there uh, encountering what Mr. Shah had emphasized or talked about, and that is drone swarming. Are, are those weapon systems like a laser able to do that? And how quickly do you think we can get uh, a weapon system like the railgun deployed so it can actually be there to counter what we see as, as uh, emerging technologies from our adversaries? Uh, th thank you, Congressman. A great, great question on, on all of these technologies. And if I could, um, just broadening directed energy out from, uh, from just thinking about lasers, as, as you rightly do in, in, in your remarks, uh, it is, in, in fact, also about uh, hypervelocity projectiles using railgun or powder gun technologies. The, these are coming along uh, at a much faster pace than anyone would have uh, anticipated, uh, certainly a, a decade ago. Uh, and um, they're seen as technologically feasible. Some of the, there are some uh, technical challenges in terms of uh, perform, perform, uh, uh, improving the tube performance uh, for, for a greater number of shots, as you know. Um, but I think these are things that will be worked out uh, with, with, within, within very few years. These have the potential to radically transform the offense-defense equation, uh, to make defense uh, much more cost-effective uh, against incoming salvos, attacks on our naval forces, on our ground forces, uh, on air bases and the like. Um, so that is a really big deal, especially as we think about how we buy back some of the value of our, of our overseas bases uh, or how we're able to push our naval forces uh, further into contested environments in the future. Uh, with respect to hypersonics, um, this is one where uh, we obviously are making uh, 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 big investments, but so are our competitors. Uh, and again, we have um, a much more level playing field in terms of basic science and technology uh, research, uh, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, than we, did in, than we did in the Cold War. Um, so we're going to have to adopt, uh, I think, a very different uh, competitive technological strategy than we've had in the past. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a great point, especially on the acquisition side. You know, they start with a blank sheet of paper, no limitations. Our piece of paper is full of no's. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. We have to find a porthole through there to find a way to, to get to yes. I think that's, those are great points. Dr. Mankin, let me go to you. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Chinese Navy capability. We see today they are retiring their legacy combatants. They're now building very capable multi-mission ships uh, that can, uh, that can uh, compete in an anti-ship environment with great self-defense systems, anti-submarine, anti-air systems there. And now, as you see, their deployments are not just there uh, in their near territorial waters. They're projecting power into the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Baltics, and they're sustaining those operations there. Something that's extraordinarily significant, I think, as far as what we are looking at. Obviously, we're trying to also match with modernized naval capability. Give me your perspective perspective on where we are as United States Navy versus the capability in the Chinese Navy and remembering that it's not just quantity there, they have many more ships than we have, but they're also now putting in that quality perspective which we used to have the advantage and give me your perspective on where we are encountering China looking at our naval forces today. Thank you Congressman, it's an excellent question. I would say, look, actually China conceptually is building three navies. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, sea denial, anti-access navy, and I use the quotes because it, it goes beyond the People's Liberation Army Navy to include uh, their anti-ship ballistic missile systems and others, uh, other capabilities that reside outside the navy. There is a sort of a, a softer, soft power navy that's a humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, friendly navy. And then there's, as you point out, there's increasingly a, a power projection uh, Navy, and that is increasingly equipped with modern surface combatants with uh, some pretty impressive capabilities. Uh, as you know, the U.S. Navy has been the, the 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 world's dominant navy for for decades. I think in a number of areas, uh, we've 
rested on our laurels a little bit, and particularly in uh, anti-ship uh, capabilities, and, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles and so forth. So I think we find ourselves a little bit of a step behind. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Khanna. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shari, I really appreciated uh, your testimony. Uh, you say that one of the reasons we aren't ready is, quote, it's not for a lack of money. And you point out correctly that we spend more money than all of our adversaries. Uh, as you well know, we spend more than the next eight countries combined. And you say what we really need is a sufficient strategic agility. And my question is, in, in the part of the country where I come from, in Silicon Valley, if you have a company that is getting money and is getting three times more than its competitor and isn't executing, the last thing you want to do is give them more money. Uh, that would be the last thing you would want to do to get reform. Uh, what is your view on giving more money, and do you think that the principles in the private sector should apply uh, to the military? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some degree of, I'd say that more important than the quantity of money uh, is, the, is budgetary stability, right? Um, if we can get budgetary stability for the department, then we can live with a budget probably in the mid-600s, provided that there's sufficient reform on cutting programs you no longer need, um, and, and orienting that to money towards future threats. But I'm most concerned about um, things to speed our acquisitions process so that we can bring things to market faster. Um, I, I do think, you know, to your question about whether or not the same principle should apply, there are obviously very fundamental differences. Um, <clears throat> the Pentagon has a large board of directors in the form of uh, Congress, right, who all have veto power over what the Pentagon spends on and, 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 and is involved, you know, defense industry has a big influence as well that, that is different. Um, but I'm more concerned about how do, we, how do we get these decisions done faster because if we keep building things on these decades along time horizons, we're always going to be building things too late. I agree with you on stability, and I know Chairman Thornberry has been an eloquent voice on stability, and I don't think there's anyone in Congress who disagrees that the, we shouldn't be funding the Pentagon on continuing resolutions. Uh, but I'd be curious from the other, uh, our other witnesses as well, you know, I mean, obviously we have the best military in the world, our troops. I don't think anyone would say that our troops aren't uh, more resilient, aren't more uh, creative and uh, competent than the Russian or Chinese troops. We've got the best military leaders in the world. So I guess what I'm struggling to understand is we're, we're outspending folks three to, to one. We clearly have better character and resilience in our troops. What's going wrong? I mean, why are we not three times as more effective? First off, Congressman, and with all, with all due respect, I, I don't know whether we have the world's best military <clears throat> when it comes to the types of contingencies that, that I described. What, what, what basis would we have to judge that? Because the, the, the scenario that I laid out was, was literally unprecedented. I, I don't know. Um, and so I think we, we shouldn't reassure ourselves falsely that, oh, yes, we, we have the world's best military, when, when the, the truth is we, we, we don't know. When it comes to comparisons between the military and, and private industry, I think those are, those are useful. Let's think about personnel. In, in private industry, you can, you can hire and fire more or less at will. Uh, with, when it comes to the military, uh, you can't just get you know, a, a skilled uh, a aviator off the street. Uh, it takes time to, uh, to, to uh, train that person up. And then, because of, uh, because of the retirement system, because of uh, all sorts of benefits, you're, you're paying for that person throughout uh, his, or her, his or her life. And that's about 50% of the budget right there. Uh, when it comes to acquisition, uh, when I used to work with uh, then Deputy uh, Secretary uh, Gordon England, he used to say, What's, what is a defense contractor? And he said, a defense contractor is anybody who's willing to put up with the mountain of paperwork that was the federal acquisition regulations. Uh, that's a defense contractor our competitors get to deal with everybody else. So in, in, in private industry, if you're not dealing with the federal government, you have a lot more flexibility. You don't have to adhere to the, uh, to the FAR. I just want to give Mr. Thomas yeah. 30 seconds. But just a couple differences. Thanks. Uh, you know, I think here's the fundamental issue, is that we, we almost have to take a back-to-basics approach for the Department of Defense, that since the creation of the department in 1947, 
we have grown the bureaucracy and we have grown the enterprise. Um, but if we're fundamentally in the business of projecting power, that is visiting violence on those who would do us harm uh, as a deterrent or, or in conflict, um, the number of arrowheads uh, in, our, in our system has, has just shrunk massively over time. We have fewer and fewer weapons. We have fewer and fewer delivery systems. But we have more and more of a support structure for all of that, which costs a lot of money. And at the same time, where have we seen the biggest cost growth over the last 15 years? It's been in personnel costs. Uh, and that when we, we talk about increasing the size of the force or anything else, it, it, it means that our downstream costs are going to be that much more in terms of compensation and benefits. So that's something where we want to try to arrest that cost growth and, again, buy back some of our, uh, some of our weapons and delivery system capabilities at the, at the pointy end of the spear. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we uh, discuss this, I just kind of globally go back to the fact that there's se over 7 billion people in the world, uh, 300 million Americans, 325 million Americans, less than 1% serve in the armed forces. And uh, I think that not just U.S. security, but the whole world security is contingent upon uh, those men and women and the partnerships that we have uh, with other countries in the world. Certainly, uh, if a country partners with China or with Russia, they have to worry about China and Russia taking them over, but they don't have to worry about that with the United States. And so uh, focus on those partnerships with our uh, allies and alliances and, and friends is uh, key to that security. Uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is I look at the fight with Russia and China and the expansion of the battlefields into uh, specifically space with China and Russia. Cyber is something that smaller countries can compete in, uh, which makes it I think even more difficult than space, but it's the cost of space and the dependence on space and the uh, Department of Defense is our Department of Defense's desire to move more and more to dependence on uh, space, the cost of space and the technology. Um, and if we become dependent on, too dependent on it, um, if China and Russia find a way to, to break or to defeat us in space, what vulnerabilities does that leave us with uh, if we no longer maintain our, our existing system. So could each of you quickly discuss the risk uh, on our DOD becoming uh, too dependent on space and uh, what alternative approaches uh, could operate in conjunction or in addition to space? Yeah, um, I think you're right, sir. We are already too dependent on space. Um, and right now, the department's answer has been to basically double down on that, uh, what is right now our asymmetric advantage in space, but also our Achilles heel. Um, the, the real solution, <clears throat> there are steps we can take in space to make our space architecture more resilient, but we also need to be building um, uh, capabilities outside of space that give us additional redundancy and resiliency. Mm -hmm. The department has, for several years, been looking at uh, a joint aerial layer network that provides similar communications, position navigation and timing, passing GPS signals, uh, through an aerial architecture. Mm -hmm. You're never gonna get the same sort of peacetime level um, cost effectiveness that you might get with satellites, but you might get better wartime resiliency because you can move aircraft around in a way that, that satellites move through predictable orbits and are easy to target. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of the challenges has been from an organizational standpoint inside DOD, you have offices inside the policy shop, inside the acquisition shop in OSD, and then in the services that are in charge of space. You don't have people in charge of sort of global C4 ISR the same way, which is what you really need is sort of building a global architecture mm. in multiple domains. Mr. Thomas, could you speak briefly to that? And Mr. Mann, can I all change the question for you? I, since I, I, I think Paul put his finger on it in terms of how we organize is, part of, is a major part of the problem uh, in terms of thinking about more about portfolios and about how you balance risk to, a pro, to, to provide the same BNP. enterprise service, whether it's surveillance or communications or uh, per, uh, position navigation okay. and timing. Um, Thank you. The, Thank you. I'm sorry. We, uh, Dr. Mankin, uh, 2017 Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments report, uh, there is a, a statement in there, force planning for the era of greater power competition, there is a call for the development of low probability of intercept, low probability of detection, communications and secure data links to create ISR, strike, electronic warfare and airborne battle management, command control communications and intelligence systems. It goes on to say, networks should support communications between fifth and fourth generation aircraft and direct 
coordination with sea-based assets and ground fire units. The ability to be integrated into network sensor and shooter should be a baseline requirement for all future combat aircraft. Do you share your colleagues' recommendations in regard to the need to develop airborne battle management systems with networked communications to support strikes in contested areas? Yes, absolutely. Do you see current systems designed from the start with open mission systems architecture, such as JSTAR's recap, as a vehicle for rapid application of these concepts? I do, and we need to have the incentives for an open architecture and incentives for interoperability kind of built in from, uh, from the beginning and not, not added or sprinkled on at the end. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm down to about 15 seconds. Uh, Mr. Thomas, sorry you got cut a little short, uh, but thank you for uh, your service to the country. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems to me that this hearing's um, mistitled. It should be ready in the U.S. military for present warfare. That we're already past this discussion. We're not talking about the future of warfare. We're talking about you guys, you all have testified about what we ought to be doing right now, um, not what we ought to be doing in 10 years. And um, so uh, and we're a little, I guess, behind the eight ball, and I'm just wondering, um, and, and I've gone through your testimony, but um, how we stumbled into great power competition. 10 years ago, it was near peer. Even five years ago, it was near peer. Well, it seems like there's a progression of titles we're moving towards talking about the other folks in the world um, from non-existent or, or um, uh, folks who are on the downhill slide to near peer, and now, and now they're even with us. Um, would, you, would you argue that say China and Russia are even in terms of power with us? Are they great? Or are, are, we par are, are we one of the great powers in the great power competition? Or are we talking about others in this? Or are we, are we all at the same, same level, one at a time? Well, I guess the place to start is by talking about some of the asymmetries between the great powers. Um, and that the, the biggest is uh, that when we talk about China and Russia, we're, we're normally talking about uh, local theater competitions. We're not talking about a global competition as right. we were in the Cold War. Right. Uh, this isn't the Soviet Union. Um, but what we see is that they have uh, favorable time distance asymmetries in terms of, of local, uh, uh, in terms of local power projection. Their ability to go and grab something before we can dispatch forces to react and counter them is far greater than it was dealing with countries like Iraq or even North Korea on the Korean Peninsula. And so I think that's, that's a big difference. I mean, the United States has the, uh, has the burden of, of uh, providing global security, that we have to be in multiple theaters of the world policing at once, and as, at the same time policing the global commons and protecting the homeland. For these countries, they're able to really focus their attentions. We also assume uh, that in most cases, they have the initiative, uh, that it's not the United States that's starting some war in Europe or in Asia, but we potentially are going to have to, relax, uh, to react and come to the aid of an ally. Can I, before I, uh, I need to, move on and, and to a different point, uh, related to that point. Is that one of the, would you argue that's one of the reasons why we spend X times what Russia or China spends and yet they can, we, we can call them a great power um, even though we're outspending uh, countries by, you know, the last eight, previous eight countries, uh, but, uh, defense budgets? Yeah, I think that I think the, the the comparison oftentimes is a false one. Again, we we have global interests. Uh, uh, competitors have uh, regional interests by and large, although sometimes getting larger. We you know we uh, we pay, <laughs> we pay professionals. Uh, they don't always have to. The I, too often when we get to these these gross comparisons of defense spending, I just think it's apples and oranges. All right. Uh, do we buy apples and oranges for a defense department? Um, Paul, if you could address and just even getting down to this, the R and D issue um, and the, the focus on R and D, you were testified in front of us a few weeks back on some of this. Are we doing? Um, you know, we're trying to do everything, uh, but do we do R and D well? Are we investing in the right things? If you looked at the budget or the the appropriations we're voting on today, when you look at the president saying he wants seven hundred sixteen billion dollars. Is all that for more steel and more 
uh, you know, uh, more platforms that members of Congress can take credit for, or is it actually in uh, b bits and bytes and electrons and things that we don't see and can't take credit for, but is more necessary? Yeah, I mean, I think we could do better um, in a couple ways. I think <clears throat> we could have a more strategic plan as a department about how we invest our R&D dollars. Right now, a lot of it's bottom up from within the services. There's value in both approaches, but having a more coherent strategy would, I think, benefit the department. But more importantly, um, there is so much innovation happening outside of the traditional defense sector that we need to do a better job of drawing that in. There are lots of U.S. companies spending a lot of money investing in better computer chips, better artificial intelligence, better networking. We don't need to try to replicate that. What we need to be able to do is to spin that technology in easily. And, and that's really the barrier right now, was we built up these walls to innovation, to bringing that kind of technology in. So we want to sort of tear down those walls and find ways to allow those companies to then work with DOD better. All right, that's fine. Thank you, yield back. Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, there's a common concern in your written testimonies that the current structure of the U.S. industrial base is ill-suited to produce the assets necessary for the U.S. to initiate and sustain a great power war. We talk about something I know a little bit about, and that's shipbuilding. The Navy shipbuilding industry is a good example of our declining industrial base. At the end of the Second World War, the United States had eight public shipyards along with 64 private shipyards. Since the 1940s, there's been a nearly 90% decline in shipyards. We now only have seven private shipyards building our fleet. Additionally, the latest census indicated that only 0.3% of high school students pursue vocational or technical education, which you need to know to make ships. This lack of supply can hardly keep up with the demand of skilled labor jobs in the civilian labor force, especially in the shipbuilding industry. Since we have reached a period where we have lost the institutional knowledge on great power wars and the apparent lack of priority for the U.S. industrial base, what would be your advice to the Department of Defense on how to protect and catalyze our defense industrial base to prepare it for a future conflict? Congressman, it's an excellent question. So, you know, I think for too long we've been focused in the, in the defense industrial base on, on efficiency not in really determining what it would take to, to yield the capabilities that, that we'll need in war, to including the, the types of war we're talking about here. And that may not be the most efficient route. Um, I think that type of assessment needs to go on. I think also, as, as an extension of what I was saying earlier, with the, the deep conversation that needs to go on with our allies, we need to have that conversation as well. Um, what, you know, are there ways that we can deeply collaborate when it comes to our in industrial bases? Or do we have to have uh, all that capability resident in a particular sector resident in the United States? Um, it it's really is time, it's overdue to have that type of a conversation. Well, let me ask you maybe a little bit different way. Should it be a priority of the Department of Defense to maintain and rebuild our industrial base for the various assets that we need? Uh, Congressman, I, 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 I think it is, uh, I think it is time, but I also think we need to look beyond that, meaning there's, there's the, the defense industrial base of 2018 is not the defense industrial base of 1945, and the, and the defense industrial base of 2030 is, I would venture to say, is not the defense industrial base of 2018. So we need to be looking not only at the traditional sectors, I think which will endure, shipbuilding being clearly one of them, but we also need to look at it to adjacent sectors that if we we're having this hearing in 2030, people would be talking about the defense industrial base, but we don't consider part of that, that base today. And where I have concerns there uh, are foreign acquisitions of, of, of some, key, some key companies in some of these cutting edge areas right. that may be uh, undermining uh, our lead in some of those areas that are just adjacent to today's d defense industrial base. Well, let me make this suggestion. I was, in prior life, I was the chancellor of the two-year college system in Alabama and chair of the Workforce Planning Council. And I was charged at one point with building up the labor force for a shipyard that was building from ground up. Getting people with those skills is extraordinarily difficult. First of all, you've got to find the people that are willing to take the train and do the work, and it's hard work. And secondly, you've got to get them not just sort of the book learning, but the actual experience of doing it where they get to be proficient at it. 
And so this is not something you push a button and say, hey, we need to hire a thousand shipyard workers and the next day you've got them. It takes years for those people to build up to the point where they're performing at the level that we're going to need them to. And I, I think about World War II. My hometown, they were, they were capable of turning out one ship a week. Now, these were Liberty ships. You know what those were. Well, we don't build Liberty ships anymore. We build extremely sophisticated ships. And so the level of expertise we need and the ability to turn them out, there's no way we could go back and do what we did in World War II. We don't have the workforce, we don't have the shipyards, particularly given the, the, the sophistication we're talking about. So it seems to me we ought to have a national discussion about how we have an industrial base, period, but secondly, how we have an industrial base that can meet the needs of the new assets that we're going to have for the future warfare. I agree. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a, uh, a follow-up to Mr. Burns' questions, and Dr. Mankin, you mentioned uh, what we're going to be talking about 30 years from now will be very different than today. Uh, we just held an Emerging Threats and Capabilities subcommittee hearing looking at China's use of emerging technologies, and one of the themes that resonated was the need to increase and sustain our own science and technology innovation and investments. Uh, as an example, high performance and quantum computing was highlighted as an area where the Chinese are proving to be more reliable investment partners than the U.S. for research, which could significantly degrade our ability to compete. So I have two questions related to that. The first is, uh, for each of you, what critical technologies should we be investing in, and are we investing enough in these areas? Uh, some that come to mind are quantum, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, nanotechnology, robotics, uh, even gene editing and synthetic biology. That's question one. Question two is any strategic areas of concern where you would recommend a rapid acceleration of development so that we are better postured for that 10, 20, 30 year outlook that you noted, Dr. Mankin. So I'll, I'll start with you. I think that actually your list is a, is a good one. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's the right list. And I think the nature of, of R&D is um, in general, within limits, the more resources, the better. Uh, because you don't know what's going to pay off, when it's going to pay off. To take the, the example of directed energy that was, that was raised earlier, directed energy has reliably been sort of five or ten years out for my adult professional career, except I think now we are actually at a, at a stage where we're, at, we're getting there. So uh, forecasting breakthroughs can be difficult. So I think, I think more resources are needed for, for those areas. I think in terms of where, uh, areas where, we're, where we may be falling behind, many of the same areas, uh, I, would, I would put hypersonics in there as well. Uh, I think that's an, that's an area of, uh, of concern. Uh, AI most certainly and, and quantum most, most certainly as well. Mr. Thomas? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great list that you've got. <clears throat> um, a couple things. One is that uh, during the Cold War, the United States was able to sustain uh, technological leads across the board. We just, we just ran up everything. Um, I don't know if we're going to have the fiscal luxury of doing that uh, in the com on the competitions that are coming. So we're going to have to be far more selective. I think your list is an excellent one uh, in terms of how we think about uh, perhaps narrowing scope. Um, I think the other is really think about what are the applications practically uh, and in two ways. One, how are they going to change the sources of national wealth in the future? Um, how, do you, how do you get rich as you look out 30 years uh, from some of these technologies and what, what's the impact of that on our, on our broader society and economy? But then there's the more limited question of what are the military applications going to be and how is this potentially going to change the way wars are fought? And in a number of these technologies, Quantum, for instance, it really happens across the board. It changes our ability uh, to, to sense. It's going to change communications. Uh, it's going to change computation um, and in ways that uh, could overthrow kind of the existing warfare regime uh, that, that we have today uh, with super sensitive sensors that can detect uh, magnetic anomalies and things like that that are, that are really beyond our scope today. Mr. Shari. <clears throat> 
Yes, ma'am. Um, so you, you heard my, uh, some of my views on this in the, in the last hearing. I think that if I had to choose to prioritize, I would focus things on information-based technologies. Those are things where we're seeing um, most rapid advances, um, and there's a lot of intersection and synergy among them. And so relationships between, um, for example, artificial intelligence being able to then process large amounts of data and having effects on, for example, synthetic biology. That's not to say there are other areas like direct energy, hypersonics, they're not important. They are important. Uh, DOD needs to invest there because we're not seeing commercial investments in those places, right? Google's not gonna go build a hypersonic weapon. We have to do that. Um, but I think we're more likely to see the payoff in information-based technologies. They're more likely to mature fastest and change warfare most significantly. I have 30 seconds left. You know, as we consider um, making sure that we're maintaining an edge in 21st century technologies. I'm concerned about our ability to enact national level whole of society plans. Uh, obviously, uh, China has a distinct advantage just in their top down uh, whole of government approach. What can we do to improve our national level coordination plans when it comes to this technological development? And I'm almost out of time. <laughs> Important question uh, that we need to talk more about because we see what uh, others are doing. Um, Mr. Heiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And as the newest member of this committee, I want to thank each of you for uh, your uh, expertise and what you bring to the table today. It's been extremely insightful and helpful to me personally. The Trump administration's national defense strategy actually states that the current bureaucratic approach centered on exacting thoroughness and minimizing risk above all else is proving to be increasingly unresponsive. Uh, interesting to me how they have raised concern over a culture of minimizing risk above all else. Would you share that same concern? Each of you? Yeah, absolutely. If I could just give one example. Um, if you go look, for example, at uh, the number of people working on the Joint Strike Fighter program, Okay, giant program, you got people doing it, you got engineers, you got people building the thing, you got people down on the, on the floor constructing it, but then you have people sort of checking everyone, right? Just, just managing the program, supervising things. What is their role? It's to keep costs down, but they're adding the costs, right? And so this gets to this risk aversion that we have in the department that ends up slowing things down, adding costs and adding red tape. Okay, well you bring up a good point then. What, what other risks are in itself embedded within a culture of uh, avoiding risk above all else? Well, I, I, so one of the things that I think Paul's uh, getting to is um, that the testing regime for systems is one of the things that really slows us down. We, uh, industry's amazing. I mean, we can prototype uh, advanced technological systems in a question of months, uh, but going from uh, uh, zero dot nine version of a system to the 1.0 version that has a manual, a user's manual with it and has been fully tested and all the kinks have been worked out, that takes years. And that's one of the things that's really slowing us down. Having, um, having more of a prototyping mindset and actually pushing more prototypes out into the field faster, um, systems that we can experiment with. Uh, and you know, the, the, the Navy developed uh, the X-47B uh, as an experimental prototype. Um, it now is, is being retired. That's a system that actually still has lots of life in it. We've made a tremendous investment, and that's one where we could be out there experimenting or we could use it for the MQ-25 program to begin uh, training uh, air crews now uh, so that they'll be ready to accept the MQ-25 when it comes online, as an example. Okay. Yeah, and I would agree with that example. I mean, there's a case where the, the American taxpayers already invested significant money in a, in a capability, not only being retired, but may even be dismantled. Makes no sense. I think the biggest risk uh, in a risk-averse culture is the risk of not having the capability we need when we need it. My father was, uh, was involved in the Atlas Ballistic Missile Program. They, uh, you know, they were given a target to get a capability in the field to defend the United States. All else was, was secondary to that. And they went Herculean efforts, a lot of failures along the way, and it produced the, the first uh, intercontinental ballistic missile to defend the United States. We can still do that, but the, so many of the incentives that we face today are 180 degrees out from, uh, from back when we were truly serious about these things, when we faced an existential threat and need to respond to it. 
If I can just, so I think, you know, one of the things that's really essential is that um, Congress helps put in the right incentives in place, sir. So if you go to like a venture capital firm, you know, they understand that a lot of their investments are going to fail. And they're, that's, that's what they're betting on is they're going to take risk, right? And they're looking for the one that's going to pay off big. We have the opposite structure. So if you look at this example that, uh, that my two colleagues mentioned about an X-47, if, if the Navy were to go ahead and do this, they'd likely get a lot of heat from Congress, right? Because you'd be saying, well, you've got this one program over here, you've got this other program over here, it looks redundant, what are you doing? The smart thing, I agree, it would be to inv continue to keep this investment we've made in these demonstration aircraft, use them for the Navy or the Air Force, get some mileage out of this, um, and be able to do interesting things, be able to take risks, do a demonstration, and maybe it doesn't work. And that's okay because we're learning from that process. But it requires kind of the political top cover to say go forth and do. Okay, let me, I appreciate those answers. Let me transition real quickly. You mentioned earlier uh, the, one of the vulnerabilities is space. Uh, I would guess probably with the emphasis we're placing now on cyber, uh, that's also an area we've got to focus on. Uh, so with that in mind, what capabilities should we uh, really be investing in? In these areas, we're, we're, we're as a as a country, we're undergoing a commercial revolution in space. So the the uh, we're actually in in some ways better positioned than anybody to to take advantage of it. DoD needs to take advantage of that. And conversely, as as you know, we're dependent in space. As China is increasing its space capability, China is becoming more more dependent on space as well. So I think we have, actually have real opportunities to turn the tables when it comes to vulnerability in space. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, in your written testimony, you state that one of the priority investment areas for air power is to maximize the rate of production for the B-21 bomber once it goes into production. And we've heard testimony from the Air Force that it needs a minimum of 100 uh, B-21 bombers. So is this number sufficient to meet the wide array of current and future threats? I can't imagine that it possibly is or that it's based on any kind of serious analysis. It seems like a, like a round you know, round number that they just kind of made up. I mean, frankly, um, you know, any, any reasonable analysis that I've seen from outside experts um, comes up with numbers that are significantly larger than that. Uh, I, I don't have a specific number, but it's certainly going to be bigger than 100. Okay. I would agree. So, uh, interesting. It was recently reported that Russia purchased 10 supersonic bombers. Unfortunately, while the United States was cutting the defense budget, Russia was aggressively investing in its military capabilities. So the B-21 program remains largely classified, but how would you recommend we invest in our bomber fleet to ensure that our capabilities are not outmatched by Russia and the fleet remains a credible and reliable deterrent? So I don't, you want to start? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. The first and most important thing is we have this aircraft to be 21 in development. Once it goes into production, as I said, maximize the rate of production so that we're buying as most of them as we can over time to start to execute this shift towards more longer range aircraft. We want to look at things that can augment the B-21, um, particularly long endurance unmanned aircraft that are stealthy, that can persist forward into contested areas, that can provide surveillance and targeting, and some limited strike capability for the B-21. Um, as well as then we want to look at munitions and other air-delivered vehicles that are on board both of those kinds of assets. Um, things like small air launch swarms, drones that might be used for surveillance, battle damage assessment, jamming, electronic warfare, decoys, all of these things that then go into the aircraft that make them more effective and survivable. I saw in your testimony that you were also suggesting that we build more bombers that are uh, able to take off of aircraft carriers and in that realm as well. Absolutely. We need a long-range strike aircraft off the aircraft carrier if it's going to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I, I wanted to ask Mr. Thomas, you earlier talked about, um, the, when I came in, uh, the record of issue, I mean, program of record issue, yeah, and that Congress can help push that for the small contractors. I've heard that back home as well uh, many times that that's an issue. Can you uh, expound on that a little bit? Because you said Congress can help with this. What are some incentives we can do to help the small companies, the small innovators get that first program of record? Well, I think I think just Congress historically has um, has just been an early adapter or an, or an early proponent of some of the technologies that end up being embraced by the military later, uh, but are, are are posed uh, when they're when they're first being proposed. And the, the Predator UAV is an example uh, of one that uh, ran into enormous resistance, and and Congress was able to overcome that. 
and to a point where people uh, over the last 10 years really couldn't get enough of them. Um, when you look at the Tomahawk cruise missile, it was again one which is pushed by, pushed by Congress. Um, more recently, um, Paul was mentioning uh, the, the, the X-47 or the idea of a long-range strike system from, from aircraft carriers where there was, there was a lot of uh, congressional support uh, despite resistance on, 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 on the part of the Navy. Um, if I could just going back on the, on the B-21 um, and um, talking about next generation strike in general, when I was in the Pentagon, uh, we were authoring the, the Quadrennial Defense Review in 2006. The 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review called for fielding the next generation bomber this year, 2018. Mm. Um, we've, lost, we, we've lost close to a decade. Uh, and so we are behind the gun when it comes to the numbers. This was a well-anticipated requirement that was going to be needed, and we failed to meet that, that deadline. The other was uh, that when we talk about numbers, not just for the bomber, but across the board, um, switching the, the topic and focusing on Russia and China, you're talking about uh, a sea change in how we think about the, the, the stockpiles of our munitions and the delivery systems that are gonna be, that are gonna be needed. Most of the figures in, uh, that were used to develop um, uh, requirements are really driven by, by old scenarios, looking at wars in the Middle East and the like. All that needs to be updated. Go ahead. I, I would agree with everything that's been said. I would just add a couple things. One is back to the, the uh, uh, continuing resolutions. I mean, I think B-21 is a poster child for how continuing re resolutions can just corrode a vitally important program. And when it comes to numbers, yeah, I think we're, I think the, we're already, uh, I think, under-projecting the bomber requirements. And so we're going to need to look for force multipliers. We're going to look for adjuncts. And I think ultimately we're going to need to look to a much larger production run than is uh, currently anticipated. I agree. Thank you. You're back. Ms. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have a few follow-up questions for you and really appreciate your, your testimony here today. Um, the first really relating to uh, Ms. Stefanik's questions about how how confident or what is your level of confidence that we have a national strategy that's looking out multiple years? I think there's, I, I, I'd think about strategy a, a couple different ways. I mean, one is the, a formal written strategy, the result of, uh, you know, deliberation, and then, and then the other is a, maybe a little bit more informal, really driven by the press of events. And I think what I have seen over past administrations, Democrat and Republican, is uh, the growing urgency of dealing with great power challenges. And I think past administrations have come to that realization at different times in, uh, in their time in office. What I would say for the current administration is that they appear to be uh, dealing with that upfront, and I think that's uh, I think that's commendable. Um, I think that the 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 concern there is, or the the, the possible downside is that we get sidetracked, uh, as was previously alluded to. The 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review really did, you know, preview, mm -hmm. foreshadow many of the challenges that we face today, and actually contained a, a very good set of operational challenges. It's worth looking back with 17 years of hindsight and asking where we are in relationship to those, the challenges posited in 2001. I think in each case, our situation has eroded. And so I think, I think the, the situation is, is much more urgent today <coughs> than it was in the past. You know, I think, um, ma'am, when it comes to these, these challenges of sort of a national strategy and in investing in the science technology base, unfortunately, not only do we not have a strategy the implicit strategy that I see out of this administration is running counter to what I think is one of the most important issues, which is human capital. And the, the broad sort of anti-immigration sentiment, I think, is actually quite harmful mm -hmm. towards um, bringing in some of the best and brightest from other parts of the world and incentivizing our entrepreneurial base here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I I guess the follow-up question to that really is whether or not we have, that we're looking at this a strategy and again where it falls short or, or does not um, with the resources that um, we we'd want to have versus the resources that we have and whether we're providing the the opportunities to address those areas when clearly um, we have to deal with a whole host of issues political as well as others that uh, impinge on our ability to have those resources 
it's, I, I, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, I think, I think the strategy um, get, gets high marks in terms of you know, placing emphasis on, on great power competition. Um, we, we've, we've known for quite some time that China was a rising power and this has been a focus. Russia has been more of a surprise, quite frankly, in its behavior over the last uh, five to eight years. Um, but we can be fairly certain that China is going to be around for a long time. Not, not absolutely certain, but we have a good idea that China's growth uh, economically will continue to fuel uh, its, its military developments. Um, so I think this is an appropriate focus for the strategy. The real question, I think, for, for this committee and, and, and Congress as a whole is really about the implementation of the strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I see is, um, as, as Paul and Tom have already alluded to, is that there has been this disconnect for so long between an appreciation of the threats that we face, the security challenges that we face on the one hand, and where we are with, with our program of record on the other. Uh, and we've got to find a way of closing this gap. How much time do we have? Uh, we're out of time. I mean, we're over time. This, these are things that should have been done yesterday, and they should yeah. have been done a decade ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Y'all have mentioned it, but I've been surprised there has not been more discussion of political warfare, of uh, somebody calls it psychocultural warfare. We can prepare for great power near peer adversaries that does but it is not a lesser included case to deal with uh, some of these uh, campaigns the Russians the Chinese the Iranians some of the, even the North Koreans have uh, undertaken that undermine our ability to defend ourselves or divide our alliances and so forth would each of you make uh, whatever comments you think are most relevant to that aspect of warfare yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's an excellent topic, and it's actually a topic personally that I'm, I'm spending some time uh, working on, and hopefully we'll have something to, to show for it soon in terms of a publication. But look, I think it's, it's, it's useful to, to realize that, say, for, for both Russia and China, they see political warfare, whatever we want to call it, as, as an integral dimension, both of peacetime competition and, and of war. We kind of hive it off. We, we see it as something separate to the extent that we even pay attention to it. They really see it as, as integral. And if, if war is ultimately about affecting your adversary's decision-making calculus and affecting your, your, uh, uh, your adversary's leadership, it is integral. And you know, so they're going about a particularly, uh, if you will, authoritarian approach to political warfare. Now. There also, there's an alternative uh, uh, tradition, and that's, if you will, it's democratic uh, political warfare. And in the old days, we used to, we used to do it uh, passably well. Uh, we still do it, I think, subconsciously, meaning our society does it, even when government doesn't pay attention to it. Uh, but it clearly is, a, is an area that deserves more, deserves more attention. I think it's also an area where we can learn from, from our allies. I think some of our allies in Europe, uh, Australia, in some ways, they're, they're farther along than we are in having this national conversation about foreign influence, foreign attempts to, to manipulate them than we are. And I think, again, it's an area where we could deeply collaborate with, with, with allies and with friends. I agree with all that. Um, political war warfare is not new. It was an integral component of the Cold War. Uh, and so in some ways, this is, uh, this, this is more of a reawakening of, of, a classic, of a classic form of warfare. Tom is exactly right, which is our adversaries have a much more holistic concept of warfare, which includes both political as well as economic and information warfare, in addition to, to kinetic activities and the like. Um, the other thing that I think is really important, uh, especially when it comes to, to Russia and maybe to a lesser extent China, is uh, a Russian uh, a conceptual rejection of a binary choice between war and peace. Uh, that it's seen that you're much more on a spectrum, uh, and it's a much more fluid concept. And I think that this is actually closer to the reality of what a great power competition is going to be than the American conception. I think this is one where we really need to rethink how we compete uh, and how we essentially can frequency hop in our activities as well uh, to, to, to match them move for move. Um, and I think the last is really, this is gonna require an integrated, concerted defense effort on the part of the United States. 
And uh, we are going to have to do a much better job of protecting our national hardware, critical infrastructure protection against things like cyber attacks and the like. But we also, I think, have um, neglected or we've allowed to atrophy some of our civil defenses for what I'd call the national software, things like our societal cohesion and governance. And these are going to have to be improved in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I, I think um, Tom and Jim both hit on this, this central problem that the things that others are doing, if you look, for example, at Russia's efforts in disinformation and propaganda and hacking, they fall within this gray zone between war and peace from our standpoint. They see it as warfare. It doesn't fit our kind of paradigm. And we're caught flat-footed. And so when you look at these Russian disinformation efforts, well, whose job is it in the U.S. government to counter that? Is it the Defense Department? They would say, no, it's not war. And frankly, I'm not sure that they're the best entity to do that. Is it the State Department? Certainly not the State Department as it exists today. The intelligence community has a role, but probably not a public-facing one. Is DHS's role? No one has a job for countering that, right? We don't have an agency for countering that. So I do think there are some fundamental questions we need to ask ourselves sort of in terms of how we're going to approach that, whose job is it, what are the tools we need. Um, I also think, right, so right now, we're basically leaving it up to people outside of government to even out these Russian entities and say, you know, Russian bots are spreading this information. Uh, so how does the government think about structuring itself to do that? Uh, there's also probably a role for legislation and, and regulation with the private sector. Just like we have uh, legislation about material support to terrorism, probably a need for some legislation that actually drives private sector incentives to cooperate with the government to out these actors and, and actually blunt their attacks. Challenging questions, and yet, as I said at the beginning, our adversaries aren't waiting. Change isn't waiting on us to get our act together and answer those questions. Um, and I'm concerned about where that leads us. All very interesting. Thank you all for being here. Uh, hearing stands adjourned.